Well, good evening, family. You thought I was going to say good morning, didn't you? Huh? Some of you, some of you thought that. Hey, it's good to have you tonight. If you're new here tonight, my name is Gary. My wife Rose. We're delighted to have you here this evening, and uh, it's our Good Friday service. We're having these at uh, three of our campuses tonight, and uh, just to celebrate life, something a little extra on this special, special week. We've got. I think 11 services total this weekend in all of our campuses, and thank you for coming to this one today. And uh, we're going to do something a little special tonight. Is We're going to worship God in communion here at the end of the service, and I'm going to preach and teach on communion here tonight. Um, one of the major events of this week, of Resurrection Week, we call it, it's the Week of Destiny, started with the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. And it ended, of course, with the crucifixion on Friday and the resurrection on what we call the next Sunday. But one of the key things that Jesus did during that week is he sat down with his disciples. It was Passover week. Now, Passover was a Jewish festival, a Jewish feast. It was one of their major ones. And it was the Passover, it was the feast uh, that they celebrated leaving Egypt. That's when uh, the 10th plague came into Egypt and God told the Israelites through Moses to uh, sacrifice a spotless lamb. Couldn't have a blemish, couldn't have a scar, couldn't have a blind eye. You, could, you, you didn't pick the runt of the litter. You had to get the best of the best. Had to be perfect. And the sacrifice told them how to fix it and with the accompaniment of the different foods that they were to eat with it. And then they were to take, uh, they were to take the blood of the lamb and with a brush and brush it over the, the doorpost, the lintel it's called, the doorpost of their house. And that night when the death angel came and it took the firstborn of every uh, family in Egypt when it, when it saw the blood, it would pass over that house and no harm would come to that house. There were probably a few Jewish people that didn't obey and didn't do what they were supposed to do and they lost their firstborn. All of the Egyptians lost their firstborn. And there's an old song you sing in church, uh, he will pass over you. And that's where that comes from. It's the Passover feast. And they would celebrate it. They would sit down as a family and eat the meal. And they would do it with their clothes on, dressed, ready to go, and their bags packed. Now, they didn't understand. They had no idea the sim symbolism of all of that. Neither did the disciples on this last Passover with Jesus. Until Jesus changed the Passover. And he began to explain to them that the Passover was not just about their history. It was about their future. That the lamb that was slain in Egypt and all of those households represented him. That he is the lamb. John, when he saw him coming down towards the Jordan, John the baptizer, he said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he began to do, he took the bread and he began to, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He began to establish what the Bible calls the new covenant, uh, the better covenant based on better promises. It's the covenant that Jesus established with us. And Jesus that week became the hitch pin between the Old Testament and the New Testament and us today that connected us once again with our Heavenly Father. That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Let's get in the Word here in just a minute. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for life. Thank you for our family here. And tonight as we join together for a few moments around your Word, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will speak life and share life with every person here. And although we're talking about the communion, we're talking about the Passover and how it relates to us right now here today, I believe you have a word for every person here today, exactly what they need to hear. And I thank you for it and give you praise. Amen and amen. Have you ever been a part of an organization of some kind and they had some kind of traditions or rituals that they did and you did it because you were part of it, but you didn't know what it was about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, in, in some religious circles, we have a lot of things like that. There's all kinds of traditions and we just do this and we don't know why 
that we do it. I read a story one time about a, a lady, and she, she remembers from her grandmother she was, she was going to cook a roast. And uh, she had a grandmother's recipe. And, and one of the, the key things is that you cut the roast in half and put half of the roast in the pan. And, and then I'll go through all the rest of it. And she got to wondering, why, why did Grandma cut the roast now? Well, Grandma was still living, so she, she called her mom and asked her mom. And her mom said, well, I, I don't know. Call Grandma and ask her. So she called Grandma and said, why is it a tradition that we cut the roast in half and put it in a pan? She said, oh, I only had a pan big enough for half a roast. <laughs> See, that's how traditions get started. And believe it or not, there's some like that in the church world that we call holy. And, oh, it's, got, it's always been this way. It's only because they had a pan big enough for half a roast. <laughs> so when we talk about communion, communion is one of those things many times. I can remember as a little boy in church, they passed, the, back then we had those trays and they had to fill them up. All the deacons had to fill them up before service and pass this tray and you get a cup. And then they passed this little pan that had, had little wafers and everybody touched them, you know, so we don't do that now. And I remember as a little boy getting that little cup and that little wafer and I'm thinking, is that it? I mean, is that it? I mean, that's not even a bite. Can I get a bigger cup, somebody? Because <laughs> I didn't know what it was all about, see. And I still don't know what it's all about, but I've learned a lot since that time. And what I want to share with you tonight is something that takes us from, from rituals. It, it takes us from a ritual standpoint to a revelation. It takes us from form to function. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, having a form or a formula of godliness but denying its power. You know, we can have a form of church but deny the power of God. And so we, we're going to receive communion at the end of the service, but I want your understanding to be enlightened, to be expanded. And, and some of you are like, I know all of this. Well, good, wonderful, just cheer me on. But if you don't, just absorb it tonight of what God would speak to you about what communion really means. You know, in Luke 22, we read how Jesus gave instruction to his 12 disciples to prepare for the Passover. But in verse 15, he said, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So it was not just another ritual or, tra or tradition. It was a command from God. Leviticus 23, 2 says this, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. And on this Good Friday, we're going to take a look at this holy convocation we call communion, and the Jews call Passover. The Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach, and it simply means to be protected under wings. That's when Jesus approached Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you as children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Jesus was saying, I will cover you, just like he covered Egypt on that, on that fateful night. And the reason we celebrate communion as a church family and we teach about it is so that it goes from ritual to revelation in our hearts and in our lives. Let's look now at what Luke recorded Jesus having communion with his disciples. Luke 22, 14 through 20. When the hour had come, he sat down to the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. We're going to swing back to that in a minute. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Now there's too many aspects of the Passover to deal with in the short time we have here today. But I, I want to bring out just some key things. First of all, Passover communion is an everlasting covenant between God and his children. A contract is one thing. A covenant is much deeper. And, and it was established, secondly, by the sacrifice of the life of Jesus and sealed by his blood. 
So it's a covenant that he established. You didn't establish. I didn't establish. Our works have nothing to do with it. Our good looks have nothing to do with it. Our standing in the community, our, our education, our wealth has nothing to do with the covenant with God. The, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus established it, and he established it with his own blood. Now, the third thing is that through the covenant, all the promises of God are released. Every promise, Pastor Chad mentioned a minute ago about healing, about peace, and all, all of those things. All of those are released and were released through that covenant. And each one of these scriptures, they refer to Jesus taking the cup. However, at the Jewish feast of the Passover, there were four cups there, four cups at the table. We're going to look at that here in just a minute. Now, since the Passover was a feast that was to teach the people about their deliverance from Egypt, we find the basis of these four cups in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. Now, it doesn't mention the four cups, but the basis for them are in here, and we're going to swing back to it. Verse 6, Therefore I say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's the first one. I will rescue you from their bondage. That's the second one. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. That's the third one. And I will take you as my people, and I'll be your God. That's the fourth one. Let's look at these four distinct promises. The first one is, I will bring you out from under your burden. The first promise and the first cup that was on the Passover table with all of the different things that was supposed to be there was the cup of sanctification. So what in the world is sanctification? Well, it's a, it's a biblical word that means to be cleansed. The first cup is to remind us that through the blood of Jesus, our Passover lamb, our sins have been washed away. They're, they're, they're gone. It's, it's a supernatural thing that happens. Isaiah 118 says, Though your sins are like scarlet, which is red, they shall be as white as snow, clean. You ever, you ever, spilled, uh, you ever spilled anything on something white, on a white carpet, on a white couch? Have you ever spilled anything red on a white couch or a white carpet? Yeah, or white dress, or white shirt. Man, it's, it's there, right? And that's the picture he's giving here. Though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That was the cup of sanctification that was sitting on the table. In our communion service, we usually take the bread first, but in Luke, we see where Jesus took the cup first in verse 17. Now notice this. this the cup that he took first was the cup of sanctification. That's the one he picked up first before he did anything else. He also took the cup after the bread in verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. This was a different cup. We'll get to that in a minute. You see, the cup of sanctification reminds us to not let the devil condemn us and tell us that we're not worthy of God's love and forgiveness. We're not. We're not worthy, okay? Well, we, we didn't do anything to earn it, but through him we are worthy, see? We're not worthy because of ourselves. We're worthy because of him, because of what he's done. See, anytime you get to feeling like, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just, anybody beside me ever feel like sometimes you're just not worth anything to God? Yeah. Do you ever feel that way, Pastor? Yeah. That, 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 that you're just, you make so many mistakes, you miss it so many times, you, you, don't, you don't get it right, or you, you should have done more. It's not because of you. It's because of him for you. It's the cup of sanctification. And, and it reminds us that we are washed by the blood of the lamb and nothing else. Not, no additions, it doesn't need anything else. Jesus doesn't need his blood and my works. He needs just his blood and my faith connecting with that. My faith believing that. My choice to believe in Jesus and to turn my life over to him. Romans 8, 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Here's the second one. He said in Exodus, I will rescue you from your bondage. This is the second cup that was at the table. This was the cup of deliverance. Say that with me. The cup of deliverance. Now, through the blood of Jesus, we're not only forgiven, but we're delivered from the penalty of sin. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23 says this. If a man has committed 
a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree. He who is hanged is accursed of God. You say, wow, that's heavy. Well, let me show you how that correlates to us today. Notice that he who is hanged is accursed of God. I want to jump to the New Testament, Galatians. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And then he references really Deuteronomy, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 23 there. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He's redeemed us from the curse of sin. He's redeemed us from the curse that's on humanity and on mankind. Now, we still live on planet Earth that is still under the curse of sin, okay? That's why there's sin. That's why there's lawlessness. Lawlessness is the spirit of Antichrist. God is a God of law. Satan is a, is a God of lawlessness, okay? So anywhere you see lawlessness, that the background of that is Satan himself. And so we see here where he, he's redeemed us from the curse. We live in a cursed world, but we're not cursed. Are you getting that? The, the world may be cursed. I know mosquitoes still bite. I don't understand that one. But it, still, we, we live in a cursed world, okay? But we're not cursed by this world. If you die tomorrow, if you die tomorrow and you're a child of God, the curse that's on planet Earth does not affect you at all because you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and you've had the cup of deliverance in your life, you see. We, we live in a world where bad stuff happens and it happens to good people. My, my good friend, Maxim and Belusa, uh, uh, in, in over in Maxim and, and Julia Belusa over in Dniprovsk, Ukraine, uh, Russia bombed their, uh, their uh, power station yesterday. And, uh, and they've got blackouts that had to turn their power off. It's a city of a couple of million people. And they targeted their power station so they wouldn't have any lights, electricity, anything like that. They're good people. They're wonderful people, loving people. Why, why, why is that happening? Because we live in a cursed world and there's a real devil that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's just very clear. But we've been delivered from that because we've been delivered by the, cur the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He hung on a tree and died to break every curse off of every life of every individual. Here's the third cup. He said, I will redeem you by my hand. I'm back to Exodus. I will redeem you by my hand. This is the third cup. This is the cup of redemption. Say it with me. The cup of redemption. Now, this is the cup that we drink from during our communion celebration. It's the cup of redemption. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious, notice this, what does it say? The precious, say it with me, blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, there's the Passover uh, Reflection there, connection, without blemish and without spot. So that means that Jesus was perfect. None of us are. <clears throat> we all got blemishes. We all got spots. We we all have we all have things wrong. We don't we we're not perfect. Jesus was perfect. He was without sin, completely. He was that spotless Lamb that gave His life for us. The word redeem actually means say well the word redeem means to buy back well. That's the inference here, but when you go redeem from, from, some, from a store, but if you look at the original language, the word redeemed actually means to be seen. And, and the, 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 the inference is that through the blood of Jesus, we are re-seen, literally. We are seen again as children of the promises of the covenants of God. In other words, we are seen in a whole new light. When you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ, you are seen new by God. You and I are re-seen by God. <clears throat> One moment God looks at you, 
give your life to Jesus, the next second he looks at you, he receives you. He sees you differently. He sees you with the robe of righteousness of Jesus on you. He sees you cleansed by the blood of the lamb. He sees you perfect, spotless, without blemish, just like Jesus, because now he's re-seeing you through Jesus. So let's not how I see myself. I get that. I understand that. But that's how God sees us. That's how God sees you and I. With all of our blemishes, with all of that, he re-sees us because we are redeemed. In Leviticus 16, after they sacrificed the lamb, Aaron, the high priest, he dipped his fingers in the blood of the lamb. And then he would go into the Holy of Holies. And there was the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. And he would go to the Holy of Holies with the blood on his hand. He would sprinkle it seven times on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat there. Seven times. Why seven times? Because Jesus shed his blood seven times for us. First of all, in Gethsemane, when he prayed so intently that sweat, that, that blood came through the capillaries of his, of his face and, and his body and began to drip down into the dirt. Uh, they say that there's, there's only one other uh, occurrence of that, and that is with uh, super, these super high-speed fighter jets uh, that, that pilots fly. Sometimes the G-factor is so great that the blood will come out of the capillaries of their body and drip out. But Jesus was not at 30,000 feet at mock whatever. He was on his knees in the garden. That's how intently he was praying. The second place was at the whipping post. When, when the Roman soldiers took the cat of nine tails, that's what they called it. It was, it was, a, it was a stick like this, or a pole, a rod, a shaft to hold. And they had nine long strips of leather. And each strip of leather had embedded in them glass, uh, rocks, uh, any, anything like that. And all, all down through them, not just on the end, but all down through them. And so when a man was tied to the whipping post, the, the Roman soldier would, would hit him and, and the lashes would, would wrap around their body like a whip, all nine of them. And then it would embed into their body all those pieces of stone and jagged rock and glass and things all, all in there and steel. And then the soldier would yank it back. And when he did, it would just rip chunks of flesh off. It's the, he wasn't just standing there going pow, 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 pow on their back with a paddle. This, this thing literally ripped all, all the flesh. Most men died at the whipping post. Josephus, a historian, said that you could see every rib front and back was exposed. All of the flesh was torn off of it. That was Jesus. The next place that he shed his blood was the crown of thorns when they placed him on his head and pierced into his head. Possibly that in his legs at that time was the only spot of his body that hadn't been injured. The fourth was his hands were pierced as they drove the spikes through them. Traditionally, we, we see pictures with it in his hands here, but, but with the Romans, the way they usually did it was right behind the hand here, right through between these two bones here, right through here, to hold their weight. The next one was when they pierced his feet. They drove those spikes through his feet to hold him on the cross. The sixth one was when his side was pierced. Now that's six. He said, I thought you said seven, Pastor. Let me take you to Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. Where is a bruise? I said, where is a bruise? Where is a bruise? It's internal, isn't it? He was wounded internally for us. You know what that means to me today? And what it should mean to you? It's not only did Jesus bring healing by his stripes you are healed physically, but he has healing for the hurts on the inside. He has healing when your heart's been broken. He has, he has healing when you, you've been rejected, you've been betrayed, and because he was rejected and he was betrayed. And, 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 and he, he had friends leave him and family members say he was crazy. And, and he was wounded 
and bruised for you. So no matter what we go through, outside or inside, see, you can't treat a bruise. You can't bandage a bruise. I mean, you can't, you can't torment someone with methylate on a bruise. Some of you don't know what methylate is. It's a, it's a horrible thing that was invented years ago. And uh, it, was, it was an experimental thing that they used on children in my, in my uh, generation. And uh, the intense pain that it caused caused you to forget the hurt that you had to begin with. It, it was a psychological drug of some kind. I see that hand, yes. You can't treat a bruise. You can't. <clears throat> but Jesus can heal a bruise. Because he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. You see, Jesus' blood is, is our authority and our anointing. The cup of redemption buys back our prosperity. It buys back our victory. It buys back our health. It buys back our joy and everything else that the devil has stolen. In a few moments here, we're going to worship God with communion. And when we do, we're going to take the cup of redemption, the cup that says Jesus has bought back everything that the Satan stole in the Garden of Eden from mankind. Jesus restored it that day. Now, there's one more cup. It's the cup of consummation. <laughs> What's that? It's the fourth cup. And here's the fourth promise. I will take you as my people and be your God. See, it's the cup of the final thing. This is the cup that Jesus set down in Luke twenty two eighteen, 18, and he said this, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He didn't drink of that cup. He said, I'm not going to until the kingdom of God comes. What was he referring to? He was referring to the wedding supper of the Lamb in heaven someday. You see, he said, I won't drink it until we're all together again. Jesus is coming again to take away his bride, the church. He's not coming for a bruised, busted, and disgusted church or bride. He's coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. The question would be, are you ready? I said, anybody ready? Is anybody ready right now? Is anybody ready? Should Jesus come right now? <laughs> Did you know at every Passover, they were instructed to say this one thing. As they were there with their clothes on and their, their belts on, their backpacks ready and everything, they would say this every Passover for 2,000 years. Next year in Jerusalem, generations came and went, lived and died. And every Passover they would say, next year in Jerusalem, next year in Jerusalem in 1948, next year in Jerusalem was fulfilled because it was when they had the first Passover once again in Israel. It finally happened. Now, since I've been a little boy, preachers have been preaching about the rapture and Jesus coming back again. I remember this little boy sitting next to my mom and we had an evangelist that was waxing eloquently about the rapture. He began to describe all of these creatures that Revelation talks about, you know, and, and he was describing them in his own vernacular. And that was before Star Wars and everything. It was before color TV and, and all that stuff. We did have a TV. And, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, wow, you know, the, the most incredible thing I'd seen on TV was The Wizard of Oz and King Kong. <clears throat> and so those monkeys, you know, that the witch had and, and King Kong. But he was describing these animals with all these wings, and I just so, I was so into it, I punched my mom. I said, wow, I'd like to see that. <laughs> Wrong thing to say to mama. <laughs> but the rapture's real. And Jesus is coming again. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know the hour is coming. I'm going to eat this Passover with you again. The same is true for you and I today, God. You see, that night in the Passover, God turned everything around immediately. The next day, Pharaoh said, take your people and get out of here. There was a suddenly, a suddenly exit. That's what the rapture is going to be. It's going to be a suddenly exit across this world as people in a heartbeat will be gone and millions and millions and millions will be gone off of planet Earth. 
But I got a, I got a right now word for you. God can change your situation suddenly right now. Maybe you feel beat up and run over and left and rejected right now. Or maybe you, you feel like you just can't get any traction with what you're doing and nobody loves you. What God can change that suddenly right now. God's a suddenly God and he can do it right now in your life. It doesn't take him any time. He can do it in your life today. The covenant that Jesus established for you and I ensures that we have more than a ritual, but we have a revelation of his power and his grace in the Holy Spirit. We can have a revelation today of that. I hope that in the last 25 minutes here, your, your eyes have been opened a little bit. You got just a little bit better revelation because we're not going to give you any bigger cup than what they gave me as a little boy here in a minute. It's, it hadn't grown over the years, nor has the wafer gotten any bigger. But I tell you what should get bigger on the inside of you is your faith as you understand what that represents. It represents the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And that little wafer represents the body of Christ that was broken, beaten, bleeding, destroyed for you and I so that you and I, I like to put it this way, he was broken so you and I could be fixed. So he took all of that on for you and me. There was, there was no symbolism there. It was real stuff. What he was doing was real. Satan didn't understand it or he wouldn't have pushed the envelope. The people around him didn't understand. His mama didn't understand as she watched her boy hanging naked on a cross die before her eyes. The women didn't understand it Sunday morning when they went to finish the embalming process and the stone was rolled away. And some guy dressed all up in white clothes said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. You know the rest of it, don't you? Say it with me. He is risen. And he still is. He didn't have to do it again. He said, I, I, I blew it this week. He don't have to die on the cross again. He don't have to go through that again. He's seated at the right hand of the Father right now, interceding for you. If you're a child of God today, God sees you through the blood of Jesus. Don't ever let the devil, don't ever believe the die. Look, if the devil's talking, he's lying, all right? So don't believe anything he ever says. And don't believe your own thoughts when you make up thoughts that you're not worthy and you're not this and God doesn't love you and you're the exception of the rule, stop that nonsense and just look in the mirror and say, thank you, Jesus, for the cup of redemption. Thank you, Jesus, for the cup of redemption. You know what you ought to do when you're facing a hard time at home and you're having difficult times? Maybe it's sickness in your body or maybe it's issues in your family and frustrations with your work. Just go home and go to, the, go to the refrigerator. Pour you a big cup of grape juice. If you don't have grape juice, get orange juice. Get something. Milk if you got it. See, it's, just, there's, it's, it's not in the juice. It represents. Get you a cracker, a piece of bread or something. And so Jesus... You said do this in remembrance of you. I just want to, you, you hadn't forgotten, but I want to remind myself today that you're for me and you're not against me. I want to remind myself today that you love me in spite of me. You love me. Jesus, I just want to remind myself that you were wounded for me, bruised for me, broken for me, rose again for me, lived for me. I just want to remind myself, Jesus, you were broken for me. Thank you, Jesus, so that I can be put back together. So can I do that at home without you, Pastor? Without a priest? Yes, you can. Because in the New Testament, you're all priests unto him. You can boldly come. Hebrew said to the throne of grace, and obtain mercy and grace in the time of need. If you have a time of need, you can with confidence come before the throne of Almighty God. You can do it. 
we're going to do it together here. Most everybody has a little cup and the wafer. If you didn't, raise your hand and ushers are going to give them to you right now. Ushers, I would like one, please. Thank you. Need a couple more up here, ushers, please, up front. Right over here. You got yours? Okay. Anybody else need one? Raise your hand. Right over here. There's some over there that have their hands up. I like to quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Jesus took, he took the bread. And if you can open your little package there and just get that little wafer. Exodus calls it a holy convocation. And what you have in your hand is a little wafered I think it's unleavened, it's supposed to be. That means it has no yeast in it. <clears throat> Maybe I ought to teach on that for a second. There's a lot of controversy in the church world about <clears throat> should we take uh, grape juice or should we use real wine in communion? Well, if you'll study Passover, they had unleavened bread. Why was it unleavened? <clears throat> because it had no yeast in it. Yeast causes bread to rise. Do you know what yeast is? <clears throat> it's a dying agent. It's, it's fermenting. It, it it's, it's, it's deteriorating. <clears throat> There's nothing in the body of Jesus that's deteriorating. And it represents his body. There's nothing in his blood. Because anything that is alcoholic is fermenting as well. I see you now. It's fermenting. Now, if he doesn't want a fermentation in his body, he certainly doesn't have fermentation in his blood. So if his body is pure of anything of death and dying, his blood has to be as well. So that's why we use a horrible tasting grape juice. It's not the juice. You understand that? It's what it represents. All of those things on that table were sacred to the Jewish, to the priests and the rabbis. But Jesus that night reached over and took that bread. He began to pull it apart. They're like, what is he doing? You're not so good. Peter, tell him he's not supposed to do that. Peter. And he pulled that bread apart and he's handed it to them. And he said, you know what this really is? This is my body. It's broken for you. This unleavened bread that has no yeast in it, it has no fermentation, it has nothing dying in it. It's life, it's for you. I'm gonna be broken so you can be healed. I'm gonna be broken so you can be put back together. I'm gonna be broken so that you can experience everything that the Father has for you. You have that little wafer in your hand right now. If there's something broken in your life, I don't care if you've prayed this prayer 10,000 times, let's take, pray it 10,001. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him and by his stripes we are healed. 
broken for you, we can be put back together. I want you to talk to Jesus right now and then we're going to partake of the bread. I want you to take just a little moment in prayer and then, then we're going to partake the bread. We'll just begin to tell Jesus, I need, there's something broken in my life right now, Jesus. There's something that's not working in my body. There's something that's not working in my family, my job, whatever it is, my family. It doesn't matter what it is. Just begin to talk to Jesus for a minute. Just talk to him. Come on, all over this building. Tell him what you need. Tell him what's broken. Let's have a target. Put a target on your faith right now. Get a target out there for your faith to reach out to right now. Right now. Now I want you to hold that little bread up, that little wafer, and say, Jesus, say it with me, say, Jesus. As I partake of this bread, I receive the promises of heaven in my life and in my body. Because you made it away, you, you, you made it real for me. And it's real now. It's not a ritual, it's a revelation of your power released into my life. I receive it now. In your awesome name, Jesus. Let's partake of the bread. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Take a moment and begin to thank him for answering your prayer. Begin to give him praise before you see anything happen. Just begin to thank him right now that his promises are true. They're yes and amen in your life. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name, Lord God. We bless you, Lord, and thank you. We honor you and praise you. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God. If you've opened your cup there, it's just grape juice. What it represents is the blood of the Most High, the blood of the Son of God in heaven, the blood of the one who was in the beginning with God and was God and nothing was created without him. The one who became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. The one who lived on planet earth, suffered, ridiculed, performed miracles, taught, gave wisdom, fulfilled his calling, declared it is finished, and breathed his last breath. There was not a drop of blood spilled on Calvary because a spill is an accident. There was no accidental blood falling off of Jesus. It was all on purpose. From the whipping post to the Via Dolorosa up the hill till he hung there on the cross, every drop was for the healing of the nations, forgiveness of sin, redemption of mankind, every drop. The old song we sing in church, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Guess what? There still is. I said there still is. There's power, power, wonder-working power. The blood of Jesus. You're redeemed by the blood. Sins are washed away by the blood. I'm just telling you what you already know, but let's celebrate that tonight. Let's recognize that tonight. It's a victory celebration every time we remind ourselves of who Jesus is for us and what he's done for us. Father, one more time, as we receive, we drink of this little juice. We thank you, Father, today that supernaturally your blood that was shed on Calvary 2,000 plus years ago is still powerful today. We thank you. We're redeemed today. We're seen differently today by you. And we give you praise for the victory that we have in you. Amen. Let's partake of the cup.